We are starting, finally, uh, Parshas Mishpatim, which is, uh, yesterday we finished, uh, we finished Parshas, uh, yesterday we spoke about going up the altar, okay? So those of you who weren't here yesterday, you just missed uh, how to make a lot of money quickly without working, but don't worry about it, uh, so hopefully some other time. Um, all right, so page 416. Um, they have. These are the statutes which you shall place before the Bnei Israel. page 416. So he says like this. So I want you to look at Rashi over here. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, what Rashi says uh, in the right column, fourth line from the top. God said to Moshe, God said to Moshe, Lo sal al I don't want you to think, Lomar, to say the following. Eshna lahem aperik valocha bezo gimel Page 416, right column. Page 416, right column. The right is the one to the right. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, what do you call it, fifth line now. God says to Moshe, I don't want you to think, well, I'll teach them the aperik, the chapter, the halacha two or three times. Until they've memorized it. And I won't trouble myself to make them understand the reasoning behind it. Uperusho in the under- explanation. Therefore it says, Place it in front of them. Like a table which has been set and ready to be consumed by a person. So, you know, you have this strange concept of Judaism. We've probably mentioned this before. If we haven't, if we have, it's worth repeating. If we haven't, so we'll tell you now. Yeah, you have the legal code of law, the legal uh, 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 um, code book of Jewish law is called what? Shulchan Aruch. Don't anything bother you about that? Yeah, it should be a cookbook. Yeah, what's a Shulchan Aruch? It's a set table. Let's learn, let's study. Shulchan Aruch means the set table. I, I mean, I, I studied my constitution test you know, for my guy, and it's true. People say, "Well, my constitution just can't handle, you know, you know, uh, Doritos, you know." But, <laughs> but that's not really where the word constitution comes from. You know, you know, study our constitution. It wasn't called, "All right, let's study." You know, let's, the American legal system is called the Big Mac. You know, that's not what it's called. It's called the Constitution. And England has got a name, and America has got a name. I don't know of any country, but Jews, okay, Jews are into food. But you know, okay, hey, hey, let's learn, let's learn some law right now. Okay, we don't know, we're not all about the laws of shatnas. You know, hey, bring me the shulchan aruch, bring me the, set the table. All right, we'll always have some kugel while we learn. Is that what? Well, what does that mean? Is the Jews are always with the food over here? Shulchan aruch. What does it mean? So the answer is like this. This goes into a very uh, another question. How do you say reason? Those of you who've learned Gemara, how do you say what's the reason? My time, what does the word tam mean in Hebrew? Taste. Taste. I mean, it's a strange thing to ask. The Gemara says, well, if the guy does this, we execute him. My time, what's the taste? What would you like, what would you like to taste? Well, it tastes like blood, you know, a little bit, you know, a little bit of gore. And then you smell burning. Yeah, well, what do you, what's the taste? You know, what, what, what does that mean? My time, why is it called the taste? Why is it, what's taste got to do with law? So the answer goes back to the question of why do you have to eat? Why does a person eat? There are two reasons for eating. One is because we need to live nutritional value, and food could just as easily have been created by God to be white or transparent, like tofu, tasteless, white, and transparent, just pure tofu, right? And that's all it could be, tasteless. And you have to eat three times a day to sustain yourself, or yes, yes, Usher, soylent green, right? Yeah, it could be, it could be anything, uh, anything like that. So the idea is like this, the idea is like that. When you eat food, Food has to be eaten because of nutritional value. Otherwise, it could be completely, it could be completely tasteless, like uh, tofu. Yet God does a, ch- a chesed for us. He does a kindness, and He allows us to enjoy the eating experience. Thank you very much. He allows us to enjoy the eating experience by making the food have a good taste. So what that does is it enhances the eating experience. And it guarantees that we are going to do it. Now, if somebody would say to you, why are you eating? Why do you have to eat? I have to eat because I have to stay alive. A lot of things we eat has nothing to do with staying alive. To the contrary, a lot of things we do probably we eat probably kills us. But at the end of the day, I don't know of any nutritional value in Bisley. But all right, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, well, eating 
is enhanced because it's got the taste in it. The mm -hmm. taste is called the tam. Right? Not only that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu in His kindness even makes food look good. I mean, food could also be, could, food could also be a, a, a taste good and be nutritional without having any different appearance. It could still be white or, or transparent. Yet HaKadosh Baruch Hu creates food to even look. People who eat with their eyes. Food design is a very big industry. And, and uh, in most, uh, in most uh, cafeteria lines, the first thing you come across is a dessert in a cafeteria line. Because right when you're really hungry and you eat with your eyes and you see the apple pie or whatever they got over there, so you put four of them on your tray because you're hungry, so you're thinking about that. That way they get you to take more. But you eat with your eyes. Food presentation is a very big business. If a watermelon, put watermelon out on the... If watermelon was white or transparent, Nobody would eat watermelon. Who, I mean, watermelon's good, it's okay, but nobody would be, they put out the watermelon and it's red and it's green and it's got all those happy colors. It even looks like it's smiling when they put out the watermelon. It even looks like a smile. Everybody gets excited. Put watermelon on people, they go, oh, watermelon, you know, as if nobody at the table knows what that vegetable, what that fruit is. You know, they're, oh, watermelon. You know, they put out, nobody says, oh, uh, a trina. Nobody says, it. when they put out watermelon, people go, oh, watermelon. You know, that's always a treat. And it's just kind of happy food. That's, like, that's a kindness. That's a kindness that comes from a Kodesh Baruch Hu. On the other hand, why do you have to do, why do you have to fulfill the commands of the Torah? For only one reason. Hashem said so. That's why you have to do it. Hashem said so. But if you understand the time of the mitzvah, if you understand the taste of the mitzvah, if you understand the flavor, what's behind the mitzvah, it causes us to do the mitzvah with greater enthusiasm, which is why the Rambam says you're supposed to investigate the ideas behind the mitzvahs. And even though, according to, I forgot who it was, I think the, uh, I think the Shla or the Chida, the Chida says, if a person would live a thousand years twice, that's how he puts it, if you would live 2,000 years, you still would not fathom the depths of even one mitzvah in the Torah if you studied it for 2,000 years. Because every mitzvah comes from God who's infinite, and therefore there's infinite wisdom behind every mitzvah. So we try to learn and study and fathom the mitzvahs to the depths that we are capable of understanding. So if you put on tefillin and you understand that tefillin is not just because God said put on little black boxes. Tefillin is a badge of honor. It's almost like a military medal that people, a medal of honor, a badge that you've been chosen. That makes it more fun to put on tefillin. If you realize that tzitzis are there to remind you that you shouldn't sin, it makes it more interesting to put on tzitzis. If you realize every mitzvah that you do that the mitzvah carries with it some sort of depth. That's why the study of the mitzvahs, there's actually a study of the mitzvahs called Tame HaMitzvahs, the rationale of the mitzvahs. The reason it's called Tam is because we are investigating the flavoring behind it, because the flavoring gives us more uh, enthusiasm in doing the mitzvahs. Therefore, God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, don't just teach him the Torah to memorize it. It's not a legal system like the United States legal system to just memorize the law. It's understand what's behind the law. And the more you understand it, the more you see it does make sense. And you see the depth and the wisdom behind it and so on and so forth. That's why it's called a shulchan aruch. The shulchan aruch, the code of law, is like a table which is set. That's the connection between the shulchan aruch and food, between the legal system and food. Because both have a tam, both have a flavor to enhance our, 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 our enthusiasm. Okay? Now, the Torah comes along, and the first law of the Torah says like this. Kisikna um, Eved Ivri, when you purchase a Hebrew slave, I think says that how the arts go translated, a Jewish bondsman. Oh, I am impressed. You see, because the word slave is really a, it's a, an Eved. We think of an Eved as, as far as a slave, but it's actually a mistranslation for several reasons. We'll see in a moment. When you acquire a Hebrew bondsman, I call it a Hebrew hired hand. We'll see why. Sheish shanim yavod, six years he must serve you. Uva shvi yitze lachov shechinam, and on the seventh year he goes free. Now here you have one of the more uh, 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 puzzling laws of the Torah. Torah says a man steals. Okay, say I steal thousand dollars. Now they catch me, and I haven't got the money to pay back. What do you do with a guy like that in society at large? Put him in jail. What happens to him in jail? 
Yeah, he may get beaten up. Depends. He's only beaten up if he's he's only beaten up if he's a low person. You know, he's if, if, if he's a fine if he's a fine upstanding murderer or armed robber. No, though he beats him up. It's only if he becomes a cannibal or if he's a child molester. Otherwise, they, otherwise, what do you call it? Fine upstanding criminals. They don't beat up. They respect you. You know, if you're if you're a low type of person, then they beat you up. They're insulted. You know, what do you put? What do you think we are over here? What are you putting? In, are you putting <laughs> putting a cannibal with us? You know, we're we're fine upstanding murderers over here. What's going on? I think they put Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer didn't like Jeffrey. Jeffrey Dahmer didn't last 24 hours. I think Jeffrey Dahmer, they killed him within 24 hours. And they knew they were killed. They knew they would kill him. They knew they would kill him. They were trying to get the court not to put him in jail because they knew they would kill him. And I, I don't think he lasted 24 hours. And uh, they, they killed him to death. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it, was, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't peanut allergies, that I can tell you. So, so uh, yeah, 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 it, was, uh, it wasn't was good. Yeah, so, so, uh, so uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer was killed because they, 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 so here the Torah says, what are you going to do with the guy? Guy doesn't have the money to pay back. You're going to put him in prison and become a bigger criminal. And then the person he stole from doesn't gain anything. So what did you gain over here? You lost, nobody gains on any end over here. So what the Torah says we do with a guy who is stolen is as follows. Bazin puts out word, word of mouth. It is not done. He's not put on a slave block like a Eved Knani. Eved Knani is bought, purchased, sold on a slave block, slave trade, exactly what we think of slaves from all those old movies. And here is an Eved Ivri. Bazin puts out word. Kaplan is for sale for six years. Stole from Yishai. Anybody who owns Kaplan for six years pays $1,000. The money goes to Yishai, and now Isaac has bought me, and I belong to him for six years. However, it's not so simple, Isaac, because I am not allowed to do, he cannot have me do anything that a slave would do. I am not allowed to carry his stuff with behind him to the bathhouse. I can't do anything. I, he can't ask me to put his shoes out for him in the morning. I'm not a slave. I am a Hebrew hired hand. I could do skilled labor for him. I could plow his fields. I could cut diamonds for him, probably build his sukkah, put up shelves. Nothing that a slave, nothing that is related to a slave, number one. Number two, the Torah says that if he sleeps on two pillows, I have to sleep on two pillows. If he eats steak, I have to eat steak. None of these laws apply to a regular non-Jewish slave, only to an Eved Ivri. So much so the Gemara says a person who buys an Eved Ivri has bought a master for himself. Okay, but what the Torah wants to accomplish over here is number one, Yishai gets paid back because there's now $1,000 available. I will learn how to be a decent human being instead of being in a prison with a bunch of hardened criminals, I'll live with a fine upstanding Jew like Isaac and I'll be there for six years and I'll learn how to be a mensch. That's the idea behind it, okay? Now, take a look at the next pasuk. That's the basic idea behind it. Now let's take a look at two more pasukim here. In begapo yavo, begapo yetze. If he arrives by himself, he leaves by himself. That means if the slave who is being sold, the Hebrew man who is being sold is single, he comes in single and he leaves single. In baal ishohu, if he is married, viyatza ishto imo, his wife leaves with him. And from this pasuk we learn that if you buy the person, you must support not only him, you must support his wife and children as well for those six years. Now, at any time during the six years, since it was $1,000 that you paid for the six years, we divide 1,000 into six, which comes out, what is it, about 166 a year. And at any point, I can pay you, we deduct the time that I've worked. If I've worked for three years, I owe you 166 times three. And if the money becomes available, I could buy myself out after the three years. You've invested $166 a year into me, my wife, my children. And at any point... I could buy my way out, okay? Now, what's the obvious question here? What if he gets married when he's a, when he's a slave? He probably has to support him then, too, if the master allows him to get married, if he gets married. But if he has to leave. If he gets married. He leaves by himself means if he comes by himself, we'll see what that means in a second. <coughs> the, it's written in order to teach that you have to support the wife. It's written, the emphasis is that you have to support the wife. If Bali Shahu, if he was married, then he goes out with his wife. Okay, but, but, there's an obvious question here. Practical question. Not on the text as much as on a, a, a practical question you should be wondering about. I mean, you know, if, if, uh, uh, if I found out that, you know, Yishai was for sale, 
I could get Ishai for six years. What will it cost me? I hear 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks. Ishai lives on my property. It costs me room and board. I have an extra set of hands. He could mow my lawn. He could, what do you call it? He could uh, plow the fields, cut diamonds for me. He could, I'll do skill. All right, what's wrong? A nice strapping yeshiva bucher for six, we, six years, 500 bucks, room and board. That's a deal. Not bad. I could, I could use some help around the house. Okay. What about if the guy is married and has seven children? And you got to support them for six years. Oh, who in their right mind is going to do that? Who in their right mind is going to do that? Why would anybody in their right mind want to go and support a guy, a guy and his wife and kids for seven years? I mean, who's who's going to go and who's going to go and buy that? The guy with right? Part time family. Uh, family is almost like a full time family. I mean, you're, you got your own full time family now. You got them for six years. I mean, why why would anybody in their right mind want to do that? Exactly. You know what it costs? To, I think there. What are the statistics? Here? I think to raise a child from zero to eighteen costs how much? A few hundred thousand, you know, and, and you know, and, th and then you got to marry her off after that. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just the boys. You know, and that's a ridiculous sum of money. What I got to go spend the money on them for? So the Torah says, "Well, one second. Look at the next pasuk. Imadona vita lo isha. If the master gives him a woman, in this case, talk about a non-Jewish maidservant, the yolda lo vanim ovanos, and she has sons or daughters." The woman and her children remain to the master. And he goes out alone without his non-Jewish wife. So you have a very, very interesting halacha here where the Torah says a Jewish man is allowed to live with a non-Jewish servant woman. And if they produce children and the children are owned by the master. Ironically, the master could only give him the non-Jewish servant woman if he's married. He could only give him the non-Jewish servant woman if he's married. If he is a single person, the master may not give him a non-Jewish servant woman. Now, why is that? Why is that? The answer is because the Torah understands that if you're going to have a man whose wife and children are supported, there's got to be a financial incentive for the master. So we are not in a slave society, we don't know about it. Apparently, the societal reality was that whatever slaves you produce have some sort of value, and their value offsets whatever the cost is of supporting of, of ben, uh, Bernie's full-time family over there, what he calls the, the part-time family. That cost is offset by the slaves that you produce, which the master now owns, and eventually will be able to sell them. Again, I can't tell you financial numbers because we don't live in the, we don't live in that sort of society. But apparently, it was worth it. That's why the Torah says, "Well, hold on for a second, Mike. We'll talk about slavery in a second. That's why the that's why the the, the, the Torah the Torah uh, uh, what, that's what the Torah says as a financial incentive. So when it's a single guy, I don't need any financial incentive because he's going to offset his own costs. How much does he cost already? Room and board." and he can help me out in the house. I've got a guy for six years. But when it comes to supporting a family, nobody in their right mind is going to do that. Now, there are commentaries that say that, first of all, uh, besides the financial incentive, there are commentaries that say that there is included in this, included in it, obviously doesn't apply in all situations, but included in this is a slight punishment to the wife because uh, the assumption is that if a man steals, uh, one of the factors that is often a factor that could be a factor, in this case might have been a factor, is the fact that his wife may have been pushing him to live at a higher standard than he could afford, and therefore he had resorted to stealing. So in case she fits that category, she also suffers the humiliation of knowing that her husband is living with a non-Jewish non servant. It doesn't always apply, obviously it doesn't always apply, but the first reason certainly applies the idea of creating an incentive. Okay, that's what the Torah, that's the description of the case. Now we'll take it a step deeper in a second. Yeah, Mike, what are we going to ask? Um, so if, if you father children at that point and they're born into slavery, uh, do they also, are they also slaves because they're still years? Or is that no, 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 they're not Jewish. They're non-Jewish slaves. Non-Jewish slave is owned by the master completely. Uh, ironically, ironically, if, the, if it, one of the ironic ironies of halacha, if I'm a Kohen and I have a non-Jewish slave and a Jewish, uh, a Jewish slave, and I eat truma, <coughs> and truma has to can only be eaten by a kohen. My non-Jewish slave is allowed to eat the truma. Same way my wife could eat the truma because I own her. <coughs> I'm the baal. I don't mean own her as a slave, but you own the husband owns owns the wife. Obviously, my wife could eat it. My children could eat it. My non-Jewish slave could eat it. They are considered my property. 
whereas the truma is one of the gifts that's given to the Kohen. In the future, Mirza Hashem, the base of Mesh is built, something you'll be giving me. So the, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, so, so only a Kohen and his, and his family and own possessions can eat it. A non-Jewish slave is his possession. A Jewish slave, even though he's Jewish, can't eat the truma because I don't own him. I don't own him. A non-Jewish slave, I could have him put my shoes outside my room, and I could have him. You know, when I first came to the yeshiva years ago, hundreds of years ago, when I first arrived at Samach, I was in the lunchroom. I was sitting at a table with a bunch of South Africans, and the guys were talking about what life is like in South Africa. In South Africa, they have servants to this day, and they were talking about what they missed most about home. So one of the guys says he misses getting up in the morning and seeing his car freshly polished. One of the guys says he misses having his shoes lined up right outside his room. Right? It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. I was in South Africa and I saw it. You know, they do the laundry for you, they do it, you know, they do everything for you. So a, that servant type of labor, you can't have a Hebrew slave do that. You can't have a Hebrew slave do that. That's the idea. That's the idea. Okay? Now let's take it a step, let's take it a step further. Any questions? Any other questions, technical questions? Okay? Yeah. I, 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 I don't know to the, what degree, but he's, su he's supposed to do it. I don't know to what degree you could actually, I don't know if you put a gun to his head or not, but he, he has an obligation, a halakhic obligation to do so, yes. Okay? Now, uh, take a look at Puzzle okay, Let's just learn uh, two more psukim here. Uh, top of page 418, then we're going to put this all together. V'im omor yomar ha'eved. What if the servant says, Ahavdi es Adoni, I love my master, as ishti vezbanai, my nine Jewish wife and children, lo etzei chofshi, I don't want to go free after six years. I don't want to go free. Six years are up, you're supposed to go. I don't want to go. So what does he do? V'higisho adono vela elo Elohim, you bring him to the court. V'higisho el hadeles o ela mezuzeh, bring him to the door or the doorpost. In this case, it means the door. V'rotza adono vesozdo b'marzea, he drills his ear with a drill. Va'avod olam, and he serves him for good. For good in this case means until when? The Yovel, the, the Jubilee year, 49 years. Okay, so they drill his ear. Drill his ear into the door. One of the ideas of drilling the ear, commentary says, because the ear is the area of communication. Now, it's a very interesting, interesting uh, two statements that Gomorrah makes. Gomorrah says, somebody who's blind is compared to a dead person. Person who's blind, there are four people who are who are considered like dead. One of them is somebody who is poor, somebody who does not have children, somebody who's blind, or somebody who is uh, uh, what do you call it? Somebody who is a uh, uh, got saras. He's, he's he's a leper, so he's outside the camp by himself, and so on. So a blind person is compared to a dead person. However, interestingly enough, when the Gemara wants to talk somebody talk about somebody who does not have halachic responsibility, what are the three categories that always go together? A cherish, a shota, and a katan. Remember that expression, cherish, shota, and a katan? Which is a deaf person, a mentally unstable person, or a minor. They do not have any halachic obligations or responsibilities. Ask your average person, if your average person had chas shalom, had a choice to become deaf or blind, what would your average person choose? Yeah. Definitely to become deaf. Nobody wants to become blind. But on a communication level, there's a certain type of communication which you get through your ears that you don't get through your eyes. Your eyes are certainly more awareness, but as far as clarity and communication, you need your ears. The ears are what heard at Sinai when God said, the Jewish people should serve me and not a, no, no one else. I am the master, no other master. This guy is willingly taking on, he's willingly taking on a master of flesh and blood, that means he's got all the halakhic obligations to God. But he is willingly submitting himself to a master of flesh and blood. Therefore, God says, that ear needs some drilling. And so they drew the ear into the door. Now, the symbolism of the door is that why would a person want to stay with the master? Why would he want to stay with her? Why wouldn't somebody want to leave? Supported. He supported. The guy said, but this is great. I got no responsibilities. My electric bills are paid. Everything is paid. I got free room. This is like being on kibbutz, right? The guy, this is great. I got nothing to do. I got to work in the chicken coop for six hours a day, eight hours a day, and I'm free, right? So God says, that's not the idea of life. 
You believe the door of Parnassa is closed to you, therefore you're staying with him, therefore you get drilled into the door. There's a door of Parnassa is open, it's an entranceway, they have to enter. And the goal of life is not to take the easy way. The goal is take on the responsibility, have a little bit of bitachon, work for your living, dive into HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and then let HaKadosh Baruch Hu give you the word. Don't go stealing and don't go relying on other people. The goal is to stand on your own two feet. Therefore, his ear is drilled into the door. Okay? That is the basic idea over here. Now, there's a deeper idea. And the deeper idea is that the Gemara says, somebody... An Eved Ivri, this is a statement in the Gemara and Kedusha, and you'll see later, I think, on Daf Yud Zion. The Gemara says, an Eved Ivri, a Hebrew servant, serves his master by day and at night. By day he works, and at night he produces children. So the Gemara says, a Hebrew servant serves his master during the day and at night. That's what the Gemara says. Okay. So one of the great Hasidic commentators, the Nesiva Shalom, says like this, you know what the Gemara is really alluding to? The Gemara is alluding to every one of us. Because ultimately, every one of us is what's called an Eved Ivri. Every one of us is a Hebrew servant. Who are we supposed to be serving? Hashem. Hashem. And there are two stages in life. There are two, not stages, there are two uh, uh, um, um, periods that a person goes through. You go through periods of day, and you go through periods of night. Night always represents when things are bleak, things are challenging, things are difficult. Elie Wiesel's first book on the Holocaust was called Night. Uh, night represents the exile. Uh, night is when everybody's mood is changed. Day is when the sun is shining, things are good. You know, everything is wonderful, everybody's happy, gum snapping, you know, daytime. So when a person has two st- uh, uh, periods constantly in his life. There are periods where things are going well. There are periods where things are challenging. A person who is a true Eved Ivri, somebody who's truly devoted to God, the true test of being a Hebrew servant is you serve God during the day and you serve God at night. You serve God when things are going well, and you serve God when things are challenging also. When things aren't going so well, a person is in pain, then a person has challenges, and a person has difficulties, and a person doesn't feel well. Whatever it is, and a person serves God under those circumstances, that is the true test of an Eved Ivri. That's what the Gemara is alluding to. When the Gemara says, an Eved Ivri serves God by day and by night, it means at all periods and all stages you're served. That tests your loyalty to God. When you get married, when you get married, some well, somebody well-meaning, well-meaning is going to give you uh, poor advice. They're going to tell you that you and your wife, this is standard, you should never go to sleep upset. Did you ever hear that? It's very well-meaning advice, and it's not good advice at all. Because the best thing you can do when you're upset is to go to sleep. <laughs> you and your wife should agree, we are upset, let's go to sleep. Because what happens is, at the end of the day, it's night, it's dark, everything looks bleak. You're cranky, she's cranky, she'll get you crankier, and you'll make her even crankier. <clears throat> you'll end up having a slugfest till 2 a.m., right? The best thing to do is say, look, neither of us is happy, we're both upset, but go to sleep. Wake up the next morning, the sun is shining, you know, everything looks great, and in 10 minutes you have a cup of coffee, it's all taken care of, then you apologize, say to your wife, I'm sorry for letting you get me upset, and, <laughs> and, 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 and the what do you call it, and you're off to the races, right, and it's all taken care of. Because at nighttime, everything always looks worse. I think people who have colds, anybody ever have a cold or a virus or something? During the day, as nighttime comes, you feel worse, right? You got my knees hurt more at night than during the day. You know, it's always like that. Nighttime comes, everything is bleak. A person has to know that life is not always daylight. It just isn't. It's not the reality of life. And a period of disappointment, disappointment is often relative to expectations. People just expect life to be a bowl of cherries. And it just isn't. It just isn't. It's an unreasonable expectation. And therefore, a person has to know that even when the chips are down, then is the test. That's the real test if you're an Eved Ivri. Are you a loyal servant to God or you're not a loyal servant? An Eved Ivri serves God during the day and he serves God during the night. That's what the Torah teaches us. All right. Yeah.